I am Deepa Sachinandani. Uh, I work as a deputy head research at Century Financial, and we have Varisha along with us. So uh, I'm a senior investment consultant. Nice to meet you. And uh, wishing you all a very happy Women's Day. So uh, let's just quickly get started. So uh, you know, in in uh, sorry, yes, when it when it comes to uh, you know, the world today, women have grown multifold. They've created a, a mark for themselves, be it in the corporate world or even as homemakers, we women are doing a fantastic job. So I take a lot of pride in that. But one area where I still feel that we really need to work is in terms of becoming financially independent and in terms of managing our own finances. So uh, according to the stats from CNBC as well, uh, almost uh, more than 50% of the women tend to you know, leave the management of their finances either to their husbands or to their fathers or to the men in their life and they, they avoid uh, handling the same. So I think that is one area wherein uh, we need to uh, cope up because in today's day and age, it's not about uh, men or women. It's about each and every individual needs to be financially independent. And uh, like uh, Anne Ryan says it, uh, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's about who's going to stop me. So as women, I think we really need to take charge of things and uh, there won't be a better time than uh, today's day and age. So uh, women uh, have been holding uh, CISO roles at US companies much more than ever before and they're now counting for almost 25% uh, of the positions. Even uh, when it comes to boardroom, uh, their positions at the boardrooms, women are accounting for almost 25% uh, of the seats and the number has jumped by 46% since last year. So I think women have gone, uh, uh, gone places. Now, even when it comes to the financial world, we have uh, the Treasury Secretary uh, of United States, that is also Jan Yellen, who's who's you know, taking charge of things and she's trying to sustain the US economic uh, recovery while ta tackling the long-term structural uh, challenges in the system. So uh, women have taken charge of things and it's time that we also take charge of things. So, and it's not just one or two women, there are many women out there who've created a mark for themselves. Oh, don't you think the same, yeah, Marisha? For sure. So of course there are thousands and millions of uh, amazingly powerful women, but just to capture some of them, we've got Kamala Harris. Of course, we all know who she is, the vice president of the United States. In fact, the first female vice president of the United States, which is commendable. She's even the first um, African-American, Asian-American uh, woman of the United, vice president of the United States. And we, then we have Falguni Nair, who's I'm sure people of women, I'm sure all of you are obsessed with Nika Beauty. Um, so she's the founder, the CEO, and um, she's also super inspirational, also a billionaire. And Kathy Wood, the founder of ARK Invest, which is an investment uh, management company. For those of you who are probably tracking financial news, I'm sure you must have seen her name pop up a couple of times. So that's Kathy Wood. Uh, Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank, also known as ECB. Um, super inspirational. She's had amazing leadership roles in the past. And as of now, she's been uh, the president of ECB since 2019. So it's commendable. And last but not least, Jacinda Ardern, who is um, the prime minister of New Zealand. She's done some commendable work and has been super, super inspirational. And it's just commendable to see women like this in powerful positions. So on to invest like a woman. So of course, this is in the most positive way possible. Like invest like a woman is actually proven to be positive, especially there was a study conduct conducted by Fidelity where um, they took a sample of about 5.2 million customer accounts uh, that people had over a period of 10 years. And they actually found out that female investors um, on average had 0 0.4 percentage points, like they earn 0.4 percent more than their male counterparts, which is actually really impressive. Um, the reason behind is honestly just science, because um, men tend to have lower fear and higher greed, which actually makes them come across as more overconfident. So what they would tend to do is panic in every tiny situation, you know, markets go up, they'll quickly panic or markets come down, they're just 
very uh, quick in their decisions. However, women sort of take time to understand and process. That's what actually resulted in them being better traders, better investors. And uh, I think this fidelity study is a clear example of it because it's not even a small sample size. It's 5.2 million customer accounts over the span of 10 years. So it's a relatively good representation uh, of the fact that female investors have in the past and as of today also are generating better returns, performing better as traders and as investors. Um, it's just a pity that there aren't that many. I, yeah, I just think that the, it's a myth that, you know, uh, uh, that we won't be good at finances or just because there are numbers involved but actually women are actually much better and uh, it's not just a stat that i mean numbers are proving it for yeah. themselves so women are actually doing uh, much better and when we are then why not it's just about uh, understanding the basic terminologies and the nitty-gritties of the financial world and that's why we are here to help you uh, understand the basic aspects of investments and how we can manage your money better so that uh, at the end of the day, the money should be doing work for you and you shouldn't be working for money. So it's it's very important that you uh, grow your uh, money so that once we retire, we have money that's doing the work for us. Don't you think that it's, it's, it's you can retire much faster if, if you have money that's put to work. So that's that's the goal and that's the aim for today's session. So uh, we'll just move forward and just before we get into how we can invest and what are, uh, so we just need to understand what are the different asset classes and what are the different instruments that we can look forward to when it comes to investments and where can we invest our money. So, um, so there are different asset classes, like you can see, uh, we have stocks, we have bonds, we have real estate. So if I were to just uh, start with uh, each one of them. Now, when it comes to stocks, stocks are basic, nothing but you, it's basically like uh, getting an ownership in uh, the companies. So um, you will be participating in the profits and the losses uh, of each and every company that you invest in. So take, for example, uh, when, when we say uh, you are investing in a stock of Amazon, so uh, you're basically going to be participating in the profits and losses of Amazon itself. So when it comes to stocks, what happens is that uh, stocks are generally considered more risky and more volatile when it com when compared to uh, bonds and uh, debts because they do not give you a fixed uh, stream or a fixed source of income. So that your the kind of returns that you'll make each year will depend upon the kind of profits or losses that the company generates. So uh, in that sense, stocks are considered a little more volatile uh, compared to uh, fixed income forms of uh, debt and bond markets. So. Uh, but if you are looking at a long term investment and if you have like, say, five to 10 years uh, wherein you can park your money in the markets, then stocks are definitely one place where you should be uh, focusing the most and having the maximum investments. So if I were to state some of the numbers in the last uh, 40 years, if you were invested in the United uh, stock markets uh, in one of their primary index, you would have earned more than 3000 percent returns. So uh, that number is phenomenal and that's the kind of returns that you get once you're invested in stock markets. Uh, so like I said, moving on to bonds, uh, they will offer you less, less returns comparative to stocks, but the returns would more or less be stable. You will earn a fixed sum uh, percentage of interest, say, every year. So uh, that is the benefit of investing in uh, bonds or debts. But, uh, Comparatively, your returns could be a little uh, less than the stocks. Then we have, if you are looking for a mix of both, wherein you want to be a little more aggressive, but at the same time, you want a fixed source of income. So real estate, that is REITs, uh, will offer you a good source of income, wherein you will be participating in the markets, uh, in the real estate market through the stocks. But at the same time, you will be receiving a fixed source of income every year in the form of the rentals that you receive in the real estate. So uh, that is uh, a REITs for you. I'm not getting into the detail for each of these. Uh, we can have a separate session for that. But this is just to give you a brief overview of, of what each of these asset classes are. The, the next that we have out here are Forex. So uh, uh, those are basically investing in currencies. So for example, 
uh, you can actually invest in uh, you know dollars and dollar is known to be the safe haven currency so we have war like situations that are on between russia and U ukraine so the us dollar is considered to be the strongest currency because it belongs to one of the strongest and the most powerful nations so uh, we've seen the dollar gradually appreciate year over year against other currencies even be it the euro or the emerging market nations obviously dollar has outperformed so uh, you can look at investing even in the forex markets and then we have commodities uh, be it uh, agricultural commodities or metals especially gold so there are multiple commodities or you even have oil out there and uh, i don't think i need to explain much about gold but again gold is considered as uh, the go to asset in terms of whenever there's a war or any kind of situation you will you will always see investors um, flocking to gold because like our moms and also used to say that you know you always need to have some amount of gold so gold uh, till date people consider it as a as a safe um, asset so whenever the situation when there's a lot of uncertainty in the world or in the markets we generally see gold prices shoot up like so, you can see today recently right. with the uh, gold is now more than two thousand dollars an ounce and in the last uh, I think in less than a month, it's more. It's up by more than two hundred dollars. So that is gold for you. Uh, so uh, we can always uh, chart out an investment plan and you know allocate our assets, our our, our funds across different um, uh, asset classes to ensure that we are getting a good mix and a good diversification. And so that whenever there's a warlike situation or something of that sort where stock markets do tend to see some correction, we at least have some investments uh, in other instruments where we are relatively safer. So um, now the. The thing is, once we've understood most of these asset classes for today's session, we'll be focusing majorly, primarily more on uh, stocks because that's where you uh, tend to see more returns. So uh, we, the session will be more tilted towards uh, stocks. Of course, there will be uh, uh, attention given to other sectors as well, but we'll, we'll be a little more uh, focused on equities. Uh, that's another term for stocks as well. So uh, let's understand why is it important to ensure that we are investing uh, across the globe and not just in one particular, uh, you know, country or nation. So to to give you an example, uh, say for example, if someone was heavily invested in uh, Russian equity markets. So uh, given the warlike situation that's happening now between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Russian equities have tumbled and uh, in fact now the stock market is not even trading. So if all your money was parked in uh, Russia, for example, then you would have suffered a big blow, which is why it's very really important that we invest across the globe and we achieve a kind of global diversification. diversification. So that is one of your uh, major aspects when it comes to investing across the globe. And like I mentioned previously, uh, U.S. is the leader when it comes to uh, even when it comes to innovative companies. So be it a Microsoft, be it an Amazon, be it a, an Apple, wherein we have iPhones these days. So all the innovative companies that are there out there are from the United States. So if you want to invest and participate in some of these big companies, it's very important that we are investing uh, in the United States or in companies across the globe. And obviously, like I said, US is leading. So uh, be it Netflix, be it Amazon, Apple, your Google, all of these companies belong to the United States. So if you want to invest in the leaders and the innovators, then you need to have a, a exposure to global markets and last but not the least one of, and this is one of the most important aspects also that i feel when when we are investing in global markets we get a lot of uh, uh benefits from the fact that you know dollar is one of the strongest currencies so we'll end up saving a lot in terms of currency depreciation of the other countries so it's not only i mean if i were to give you an example also so uh, the dollar has been strong across, I mean, when, when compared to emerging market nations, uh, be it Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, or for that matter, even when you compare the dollar with the euro, dollar has given amazing returns. So um, uh, on this slide, like you can see, I'm just trying to give you a basic example. Uh, if, if someone would have invested in India's uh, best, uh, one of the 
common known indices uh, an index for the ones who don't know an index is basically um, you can you can it represents a, a, a list of companies so for example in nifty it's representing almost 50 companies in india together so you can just buy uh, all those 50 stocks if you want to purchase then you can just buy one uh, index and you'll have exposure to all of those stocks and when it comes to United States, one of the most common uh, and referred uh, index is the S&P 500, the SPX 500, which is tracking uh, 500 largest companies in the United States. So, uh, so the the thing is, if uh, if someone would have invested, say, uh, close to 10 lakhs or 1 million uh, rupees uh, in India back in 2008, 2008 was the year when we had financial crisis and a recession. So that was the dip. So suppose if someone would have invested back then, uh, it would have been equivalent to close to $25,000. So if you would have invested in Nifty, that amount would have grown up to $33,000. Okay, so of course, that's a significant jump uh, from 25,000. You have $33,000 if you've invested in Nifty. Uh, but if you would have invested in the S&P 500, that is the US benchmark index, then that same amount would have actually grown up to seventy. Two thousand dollars. So you see the difference. It's huge. It's humongous, and that's because of currency depreciation. So uh, Nifty has also grown by almost one hundred and sixty percent in the last. I mean, it's given uh, one hundred and sixty percent returns in the last twelve years, and S and P has also given like one ninety percent. So there, the difference is not that much. It's just six thirty percent. But uh, out here, if you see the return is almost uh, doubled, the difference is 100% and that is because of the rupee depreciation. So which is why it's very important that we are investing in, in uh, you know, dollar based assets and uh, you will, you can get that exposure if you're either investing in gold or even if you're investing in, um, you know, US stocks or the S&P 500, you will get that exposure. So it's very important that if you're currently investing, say, in any of the emerging market nations or even in anywhere else, it's important that you have certain exposure to uh, the dollar as well. Now, uh, we've, now that we've understood that these are the kind of assets that we can invest in and why it is important to, uh, to invest in dollar-based assets, it's, uh, the next question that could pop up in someone's head is that, you know, how do I know when to invest and how much to invest and things like that. So, so the easiest and the most hassle-free approach to doing that would be to invest, uh, to follow an SIP-based form of investment. Now, when I say SIP, it means systematic investment planning. What happens is that, so, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, exactly time the markets and to understand that, oh, this is uh, the amazing dip opportunity and I need to invest right uh, from here and then we'll have amazing returns. So it's very difficult to do that. And um, most importantly, it's very difficult to, you know, put in a big lump sum amount at one particular time. So what SIP does is that you can follow a systematic planning wherein every month or every quarter you can decide what amount you want to park into the um, markets or be it any any area where you want to invest. So if you want to invest in gold or if you want to invest in, an, uh, in a stock, you can decide how much you want to invest and every month irrespective of uh, you know, where the markets are or what the forecast is, we invest a fixed amount every month into the markets. So this out here, you can see there's an, uh, this is an example of a thousand dollar SIP if we would have done that in the S&P 500. So if you were investing thousand dollars every month in SPX 500 since 1988, I mean, can you believe it? That amount would have grown up to 3.4 million. So your investment is just 400,000 but your money would have like grown almost 10 folds to 3.4 million. So uh, it's it's a very easy and hassle-free approach wherein you don't need to uh, decide or discuss or uh, you know take that decision, oh, is it a good time to invest or no? And it's a more disciplined way of investing. We, these, and these are some of the most basic um, you know, benefits of uh, SIP form of investments. Uh, in fact, if someone would have invested in the last 10 years itself, the money would have doubled, more than doubled. So uh, gradually, if you can see, the more the time you are invested in the markets, the more the returns. Uh, and 
the the returns have uh, gone down but that's like if you're invested for 40 years your returns will be much more if you're invested for 30 years you'll obviously see slightly lower returns so uh, it, it's the best is to be invested in the markets and from a long-term perspective so if you want to retire faster i think an siv form of investment is what we all need to stick to so uh, like i was saying these these are some of the advantages of uh, sip wherein uh, obviously it's very pocket friendly because you you know you don't need to put in a lump sum amount uh, and you can decide a fixed uh, amount uh, based on your uh, based on what you are comfortable with on a daily basis and and it does provide a lot of compounding effect and most importantly it sticks to a financial discipline and the ones who are disciplined in the markets are the ones who will be able to uh, you know, actually uh, make a lot of money. Uh, how many of y'all are actually uh, subscribed to uh, Netflix? Uh, can we can we get a yes or a no? If you are subscribed to Netflix, then a yes. You can just type it in the chat box there. Uh, no one subscribed to Netflix. Okay, there we go. One well, yes. <laughs> or is everyone using someone else's Netflix? Is that the situation? <laughs> Could be. Okay. Uh, uh, and next question: How many uh, of us do? Uh, uh, how many of us uh, have an? Oh wow. Okay. Okay. Next question: How many of us are using uh, an Apple product, be it an iPhone or an iPad or? Um, Anything and uh, Apple AirPods. Watch, earpods, AirPods, yeah. There's a reason why we're asking this. You'll you'll see soon. <laughs> okay, we've not got any responses for iPhone. No, no, we don't have iPhone lovers out here. Okay, we do. Yeah, yes, we do. Okay. So, um, okay, and how many of us have ever shopped on Amazon? Okay, yes, we again. So see, the idea is that if we are a part and if we are actually uh, responsible for the business of these companies, then uh, isn't it important that we actually participate in the profits of these companies and we actually own these companies? So, uh, I mean, if, for example, if you love owning an LVMH bag, then uh, don't you think uh, we can actually invest in uh, the LVMH company and become owners of this company and enjoy the profits as well? So, or for example, if you love Starbucks and if you believe in uh, that Starbucks is the future and will do well, so why not invest in Starbucks? So, so this is that's that's the reason why we say we need to be invested in in markets and uh, most importantly, uh, when when we are using these products on a day to day basis and in our daily lives, it's very important that we invest in in these companies as well and in fact reap the benefits as well. Like we are the ones who are contributing to the business then why not actually be owners of the company and make some money out of it so uh, so that's that's the that's the intention and that's that's how we need to look at markets and that's how we need to look at uh, equities so um, now that we've seen uh, the different forms of investing i i don't know if you saw uh, and you you saw the slide about um, uh, sip wherein we spoke about how if you would have uh, started investing or if our parents would have done that for us, if our parents would have invested $1,000 every month in uh, in the SPX 500, uh, then I think uh, most of us would have been retired by now. We would have $3.4 million in our account. So uh, I think it's time we take this up and we do this for our kids or um, for ourselves also for that matter. So. Um, it's it's a very hassle-free, uh, less uh, I mean, a systematic approach wherein every month you're investing uh, in a particular index. Or, or I mean, this can be different. Like if you if you believe in Amazon, you can invest a fixed amount every month in Amazon. So whatever you believe in, or if you believe, like I personally would believe in the U.S. economy, and it's just an easy way wherein you're investing in uh, 500 largest companies in the United States together with just thousand dollars every month so it's just a very simple and hassle-free approach um so another we've seen that we will just look at uh how we can invest through what is another different method of investment and warisha will throw some light on that 
Okay, so uh, basically there are obviously a lot of different methods of uh, investing. One of them being the Peter Lynch method, which is like a very simple, systematic way of investing. I know Deepa went over the SIP, but this is another method of investing. Um, so Peter Lynch basically is a person um, who was a, one of the greatest mutual fund managers of Fidelity Investments. And um, he, I'm sorry, he guided Fidelity Investments, uh, Megalyn Fund, to a 29.2% average annual return from 19, sorry, can you press the next Sorry, can you press the next slide if it's not can you, showing? In, is it, see, is it can, visible can now? Can you all see the slide right now? The current slide? Uh, which shows uh, the image of Peter Lynch and then uh, can anyone just say a yes if it's or no? Okay, I think it's showing because they've said it's right. okay now. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so basically, uh, Lynch actually had something called the common sense approach. Um, and it's basically his famous quote was go for a business that any idiot can run because sooner or later, any idiot is probably going to run it, which I think we have all seen with time with multiple companies. Um, so the idea is basically go for a business that's actually very simple, systematic, um, something that you know we all sort of uh, use every single day or are in contact with every single day. Um, so the thought experiment behind the Peter Lynch method um, basically what he did was, which was super interesting, he told a bunch of school children to construct a portfolio and he made those school children pick their favorite stocks. So as, as suspected, they picked Nike, McDonald's, Natal Inc, et cetera, like all these very like easy to assume stocks that school children would pick. And now what he did is um, he put those together and actually that bucket of stocks outperformed um, the best, and it, it turned out to outperform, and it was one of the best performing fund on the Wall Street, which is amazing. Um, so it's basically very simple, like it's a very simple method. Investing doesn't have to be so complicating. It doesn't have to have some next level research analysis. Exactly. Like sure, there is that segment, of course. However, there are simpler methods. Sometimes the best method to invest is. A simple just keep method. It like just yes. keep it simple to the point, and, it, that, and that's what Peter Lynch was all about, really. And it, time and again, proved to be very effective. Sorry. Um, so, circle of competence. Basically, um, so Buffet summarized the concept in the motto: uh, know your circle of competence and stick within it. The size of the circle is not very important. Knowing its boundaries, however, is vital. Now, each and every one of us, as women, as people, have our own circle of competence. Now, there are um, certain brands that we would say, which is within our circle of competence. And I'm sure each and every one of you utilize these or come in contact with these. And I'm definitely sure you've heard of these um, on, our, on a regular basis. I mean, if you want a bag, you'll go to coach. You want to watch Friends, you'll go on Netflix. So I'm sure each and every one of us connect or relate to one of these stocks. And like Deepa mentioned previously, wouldn't it be good? This is why we were asking about Netflix and Amazon. Like, wouldn't it be good we actually invest in certain stocks that we believe in and the ones that we actually use on a regular basis? So these are like big, good, well-established companies that you are in contact with, that you utilize every single day. It's just, it's just basic you know, um, sense to invest in them. Like yeah, it's so super like, simple. If you are an LVMH fan or an Estelado fan. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I think oh, you will be understanding the business of Estelado uh, much more than what, uh, um, you know, a man would be understanding. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, then why not, uh, you know, make use of your expertise and understand the business. You'll understand the business of the company much more Definitely. than uh, someone else. So then why not invest in the business if you're understanding how, the business works so uh, like a basic example for example like if if say uh, starbucks uh, increases uh, their their coffee prices uh, like say by 30 40% and despite that if you see that uh, you know 
uh, you're, oh, you're a regular visitor to Starbucks and the price increase doesn't matter to you. And even, I mean, when you see the crowd also, if you see that there's no dip uh, in, in the number of people, uh, you know, still um, drinking their coffee, uh, then that means, uh, you know, the profits of the company are going to go up much more. So that's that's an investment opportunity. So you, it's uh, what what the, the circle of competence is basically talking about is that you need to invest in stocks that you can relate with them that you understand uh, understand the business about. If I tell you to invest in a cloud computing business, I mean, wherein you probably are not even aware of what cloud computing is, or uh, or if the, uh, or you know if something is really tech savvy and it goes above your head, then there's no point because you'll not be able to understand the dynamics of uh, the business and the company. And uh, just analyzing the numbers sometimes may not help. So it's important that you invest in stocks that you understand and you can relate with. Uh, so that, uh, of course, you'll have uh, investment managers or advisors or consultants who, who can guide you about companies that you're not aware of as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're doing uh, investments personally, then, then I think you can stick to this method because it's easiest and uh, not that complicated and something you can relate with. So that is what Varisha uh, was also talking about. Like, and Peter Lynch advises the same. So, yeah. yes. so just keeping it simple. Yes. That's the goal. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, the Lynch investing mantra. So this is basically, we've just gone over this. So only buy what you understand. So he had three major mantras. One is only buy what you understand. So you don't want to go for, like you have mentioned earlier, like these cloud computing companies or anything. Let's just say if you don't have knowledge in that area, you, I'm sure people who are obsessed with bags, for example, you like coach, you will like uh, specific brands, LVMH, all of these, and you would always go for them because you actually understand them. Um, there's, there's no like major complicated things required behind the, those specific brands. So I'm sure you uh, you can understand those brands. You can go for it. If you understand cloud computing companies, go for that. So yes. buy whatever you understand, basically. There's no need to go for any, just because your friend mentioned some, you know, very uh, sophisticated name, you don't have to go for that. It's you personally. It's your money. It's your investments. You need to understand what you're investing in. That's the first one. The second one is always do your homework. Um, as mentioned previously, women in general are suited to just do their research and actually as a consultant i work with uh, both men and women and i've noticed like women love to do their research like to actually take their time to understand get into the nitty-gritty of companies or returns so on and so forth and and that's amazing honestly it's amazing that we do that um and that that's basically the second uh, mantra and the last one is invest for the long run so when you're investing, if you actually believe in a company, let's just say you believe in Starbucks, you really believe in LVMH, you're actually investing for the long run. So it's not even like for the short. You can always go for companies that pay dividends, for example. Um, so you can get like a quarterly return. You're basically a shareholder. So you can actually get something for investing in those companies. So those are the three main. Yes, yeah, so it's always long run. So yeah. like if you invest in a in a particular stock and if you just see the share price fall by three four percent so that should not scare you because yeah. you're in it for the long run mm -hmm. so uh if you expect immediate returns and that's like trading so that's a different world altogether it, when you're when you're investing that's a long-term uh plan and uh, you need to stick to uh, stick to that of course uh, we need to analyze the fundamentals of the company. If the business is not doing well and if things are not doing well, then you need to take a calculated decision. But otherwise, if things are doing well, just because the stock price has fallen and is lower, that doesn't mean you sell the stock and panic and sell it mm -hmm. in the short run. You need to hold it from a long-term perspective. So, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much <laughs> um, Right. So the current scenario, I'm sure all of us have been aware of the Russia-Ukraine war that's been going on. Um, so it's really unfortunate what's been happening sure. right now. And it's also caused a lot of movement in the market. Um, in fact, US and European allies um, are planning to uh, ban the imports of Russian oil. Um, and they're having discussions about it. And therefore, there's been a big rally also with oil. I'm sure people who are tracking oil, they can see it's been skyrocketing. The um, ones who are even filling their petrols would Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for, it's, it's costing all of us as well, you know. 
um, then even U.S. allies, NATO, the European Union, G7 countries, they're all preparing to impose sanctions against Russia in the coming days. Um, so it's all just basically a move to try and make Russia stop uh, the attack on Ukraine. And um, actually, as of now, more than 1.5 million people have fled from Ukraine, which is really unfortunate. And it's, it's actually really sad what's been going on there. Um, and uh, last about, yeah, the U.S. secretary um, basically said that the U.S. wants to avoid getting into a direct conflict with Russia. This would actually create a really, really big issue if that happens, uh, since they're both very powerful economies. So um, they're actually trying to avoid the conflict and um, try and just resolve whatever is going on between Russia and Ukraine without taking it further. Um, and this has actually impacted the market a lot in terms of oil, gold, commodities. Um, and yeah, you can cover Yeah, this. like, like uh, Varisha was saying, uh, we've seen a, a pullback in stocks to a great extent. Uh, gold prices have uh, uh, crossed $2,000 uh, an ounce. Uh, until a month back, it was close to $1,800. So there's a jump of almost $200. Crude oil prices uh, have skyrocketed. Uh, so yeah, even palladium, wheat, all of these commodities. Uh, Russia is basically uh, known to be uh, you know, the exporter of major commodities. So uh, when when there are threats of uh, sanctions where uh, where when you know their supply is in question so we've seen uh, commodity prices uh, go mm -hmm. up the roof so uh, yes there has been uh, a jump in commodity prices and at the same time because there's a lot of uncertainty uh, stock markets generally don't like any kind of uncertainty and especially we, we've seen uh, during warlike situations uh, we generally see a pullback uh, in the equity markets uh, because now markets have a fear that because commodity prices have gone up so much that inflation uh, is on the rise which is not really good for the economy and that is why we have seen a pullback and uh, Russia in, being like the biggest yes, like they, yes. back in 2020 actually per day they were exporting 5 million barrels, barrels of oil per day yeah. so for US to actually have these talks and ban the imports, it's, it's going to cause more, way more movement. So uh, that that is the current situation. But uh, again, if you are into markets from a long term perspective, if you consider this, I mean, obviously, it's very really unfortunate that the war is happening. But if you consider it from an investment perspective, this turns out to be an amazing uh, investment opportunity. So uh, this is, uh, if you can see out here, we've given um, a table of what has happened previously whenever we've seen war-like situations uh, in, in the market, what has happened to the S&P 500. So if you can see on an average, uh, the markets do pull down. The average is just 5%, but if I were to talk about the major uh, issues, for example, uh, when North Korea invaded uh, South Korea, what happened? The markets were down by almost 13%. Uh, this is what happened, uh, and it took uh, 20, it, there was a fall for almost 23 days. Now, what happened, it's important to understand what happened a year later after the war. So if you bought this dip a year later after the war, uh, you would have seen returns of almost 30%. Uh, back in uh, 1941, when uh, we had the Pearl Harbor attack, the fall in the markets was 20% and it went on for a long time though. But then the recovery was also significant. So. Uh, on an average, if you uh, buy the dip uh, in the next 12 months or in the next six months, for example, you can expect a return of 10%. In the next 12 months, you can expect a return of close to 14%. So uh, there have been only uh, three such instances where, uh, you know, the markets have uh, continued uh, to uh, trade lower. Uh, but otherwise, uh, out of all the other situations when we've seen a war, this turns out to be a decent uh, investment opportunity. So I think uh, we all should capitalize uh, on this opportunity. So also another favor, um, another factor working in our favor is uh, generally um, SPX, especially S&P 500, tends to do well in the month of April. If you can see, 
this is the month of um, April and out of the last 15 years, there's only one year where it has given a negative return. So, um, and there are various reasons uh, why SMB uh, tends to do well in the month of April. There are uh, the tax filing and things like that which happen uh, and we are creating new portfolios and things like that of mutual funds. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of theory behind this, uh, but uh, if you were to understand plain and simply, uh, the things are working out uh, in a way wherein uh, hopefully markets will uh, bottom out by the end of uh, March, and then we could see uh, if the seasonality were to play out, then we could see a, a, a jump in S and P 500 next month onwards. So. Um, when it comes to timing, this could be a good time where you can start entering the markets. Also, um, the S and P 500 uh, is already uh, given a correct. When, whenever uh, an index falls by more than 10 percent, we call it as a correction. So uh, the S and P 500 is al already trading at a discount. I mean, it has already entered the correction phase, um, and from its peak, it is down by almost 12 percent now. Yeah. Uh, so it's. It, it is down by 12 to 15 percent and uh, so history says that whenever the index is down by 12 to 50 i mean whenever it enters a correction phase a year later uh, the average return has been almost 25 percent and the probability of it being higher uh, has been uh, 90 percent so you know we have some amazing probability and uh, some good numbers so i think uh, this dip in the markets while uh, the war is uh, obviously a very unfortunate situation uh, but when it comes to an investment uh, perspective this turns can turn out to be uh, a practical uh, good decision to start entering the markets so um yes so uh, that is it that we had for today uh, we'll we'll uh, leave it open now for any questions that you have or uh, anything that you didn't understand and you would like us to repeat or anything for that matter or provide, uh, you could even provide your feedback as to how was the session or uh, uh, do you want us to repeat more of uh, something like this or you want some other um, aspects that we can throw light on you can always uh, share your feedback uh, you can type it in the chat uh, itself uh, we are awaiting any kind of questions or any feedback We'll appreciate it. Anything you want us to clarify further? Or is everything good? So we'll just wait for another minute. Uh, if we don't have any questions, then we'll end the session. Okay, so Amina is asking, how much should I start as a minimum investment as a novice? Um, okay, so well, uh, that would again uh, depend on, uh, I mean, on your goals, on your investment horizon. So I cannot directly mention that how much you need to invest right now, uh, but uh, to you know, to a bare minimum investment should at least be close to. Uh, at least five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. Five to ten thousand dollars. Yeah, that decent. should be your. Uh, you know, you can start with that so that you don't need to take um, a leverage and uh, you know so that your risk is minimum. So you can start with that and then gradually every month you can stick to an SIP form of maybe five hundred or thousand dollars, whatever you are comfortable. But uh, at least uh, five thousand dollars would be uh, a decent uh, way to enter. I mean, a ten thousand would be better, but at least five thousand. You can start with like smaller right. trades and smaller returns that way, and yeah, take it up from there. So uh, Rahul Gupta has a uh, question that the S and P five hundred has been performing well in April uh, um, and May. You further elaborate why? Uh, so uh, yes, like I was saying, uh, we have a lot of uh, you know uh, portfolio uh, reallocation done in uh, the I mean at the end of March because uh, 
the tax filing in the United States is around uh, around then. So we see a lot of movement happening at the mutual funds and uh, uh, the big investment houses in the United States, wherein uh, they will book their profits and then again uh, re-enter in the month of April. So which is why we see uh, stocks generally tend to do uh, well. Also at the start of the year, Jan and Feb, um, uh, the start is usually when you know people are trying to analyze how the economy is and how things are going to be uh, for the year ahead. So uh, or maybe uh, there are. Um, you know, decisions taken by the U.S. Federal Reserve and things like that uh, regarding the interest rates. So the start of the year, uh, there is not much clarity and stock markets generally do not like when there is no clarity. So as and when uh, the mutual funds and uh, the other investors start getting clarity, the markets tend to do well. So April, we've seen on an average tends to do well. And that is uh, the reason uh, behind April being amazing for stock markets, especially for the S&P 500. Um, what yeah. do you recommend? Stocks, Forex, commodities, etc. Um, this really just depends on you personally and your uh, risk profile and how Sorry. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so, uh, like she said, it uh, it really depends on how uh, uh, how comfortable you are and how um, much risk you are willing to take. Uh, but uh, it has to be a, a well balanced, diversified approach. So, uh, there's a very famous saying uh, that you do not need to put all your eggs in one basket. So it's very important that we have some allocation to stocks and some to commodities as well. But uh, if you are investing from a long term perspective, uh, then I would suggest a maximum allocation, yes, towards uh, stocks. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's if you have a long term uh, perspective in mind. Uh, and and that's how things are uh, there according to the asset allocation rule as well. They say uh, whatever your age is. Previously, it was like 100 minus your age should be uh, the allocation into uh, equities or into stocks. Uh, in fact, now the number has gone up too because inflation is so high and our expenses have gone up so much. Uh, the number has now changed to 120 minus your age. And that is what we should be investing in um, stocks. Or Usually when we do forex and commodities, we prefer to do it for more of a short to medium term uh, yeah. basis. Yeah. So it really depends on also if you're into just short term or long term. Or you can also have like a mix of well diversified portfolio, let's say 50% in stocks and like 30% in commodities so on and, and so forth yeah. and the rest in other asset classes. So that way it's well diversified. You've got exposure into various uh, asset classes because there could be a scenario where uh, let's say stocks are performing good, but commodities are performing bad, but at or, least, vice versa. or vice versa. So in these situations, what happens is at least you've got a well diversified portfolio. You can gain in one area at least. Uh, rather than the other. So it's given because if you just have it concentrated in stocks, for example, if uh, stocks are down, your entire portfolio is down. So it's better to have a well diversified mixed portfolio. So yeah, and that's yes. what we do here as well. Yes. Like we sit with the clients and we make sure um, it's a well diversified uh, portfolio based on the client's risk appetite, so on and so forth. So so uh, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, if we have any further questions, we'll, we'll be there for a minute or else we'll end the session. Uh, so at Century Financial, we do conduct regular uh, webinars or seminars or maybe on a weekly or a fortnightly basis. So in case if any of you are interested, uh, you can always uh, reach out to us and uh, you know, be a part of these sessions. Uh, so looking forward to all of you out there. Um, yeah, I, I don't, okay, we have, can you organize a session to explaining the diversification and the term? Definitely, uh, that's, uh, we can do that. We can talk about uh, the different asset classes and why it is important to uh, diversify. So uh, we'll, we'll do that, uh, Amina. Um, and we'll, we'll notify you once when, when we've organized the session. So we can do that because so uh, at Century Financial, basically, uh, we do say that uh, you are supposed to be independent, but you are never alone when it comes to Century Financial. So any help, anything, you can always reach out to us. And uh, I think uh, yeah. that's it for uh, today's session from uh, me and Marisha. And uh, we're looking forward to 
uh, seeing you all for uh, our other sessions and um, happy women's day happy women's day once again yeah all right thank you so much thank you everyone take care bye bye